Hey there, it's Faisal Munay from Drop Group. We are at the forefront of merging AI, blockchain, and extended reality technologies uh, to revolutionize all industries and drive digital transformation. You're listening to The Edge of NFT, the show that is all about making waves in the world of Web3 innovation by exploring the exciting intersection of AI, blockchain, and extended reality technologies. Let's dive in. Hey, Web3 Curious listeners, stay tuned for this special episode filmed in Riyadh and learn how the convergence of AI and Web3 is going to transform industries and consumers, both in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and globally. Also, find out strategies for communicating the value of Web3 to enterprises and actually getting them to say yes and last but not least, you're going to get your local Saudi designer alpha for your best digs. So you're not going to want to miss this episode. All this and more on Edge of Drop. Cue the intro. Welcome to the Edge of NFT, the podcast that brings you the top 1% of Web3 today and what will stand the test of time. We explore the nuts and bolts of the business side and also the human element of how Web3 is changing the way we interact with the things we love. This podcast is for the dreamers disruptors, and doers who are pumped about this ecosystem and driving where it goes next. So today's sponsor episode features Basil Monet, the co-founder and chairman of Drop Group, a generative AI platform that helps corporations and communities to rapidly build Web3 experiences. Since its launch in 2018, Drop Group has worked with Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, and leading professional sports organizations to innovate the digital experience space. Basil also founded SSSIT in Saudi Arabia, where he developed a platform that facilitated over $100 billion in transactions for government agencies. With a background at major tech firms like Microsoft and Oracle, he has played a key role in connecting industry leaders and advancing technology in the public sector. Just a little bit more information about uh, the company Drop Group we'll talk about today that we'll dive right into it. They are a global company specializing in AI and blockchain technology focused on transforming industries through real-time applications of these technologies. The company is engaged in large-scale digital transformation projects utilizing its patented Gen AI platform and proprietary AI models to enhance operational efficiency and innovation across very different sectors all over the world. So great to have you on the show. Well done. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, you know, a lot to read because a lot a lot happening in, in the world of sort of blockchain here in the kingdom, which is uh, what brings us, I should mention, this is live in Riyadh. Um, we've been here for the last few weeks going to all sorts of great events and running into each other a lot. And uh, I think what, what you all are doing is, is, is definitely something the world needs to understand better. So it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Josh. So um, I, I want to learn a little bit more about your diverse career in technology. Can you share maybe a pivotal moment or experience that's kind of shaped your journey and got you thinking about things from an AI and blockchain perspective? Because you've worked in technology for quite a long time. Yes. Um, well, Basically, what we what got us started with uh, generative AI back in 2016 was uh, an idea of how do we turn uh, videos into shoppable real estate. Um, this way, we can turn viral videos into our crazy e-commerce events, and this way, we also save a. Uh, uh, um, uh, innovating uh, and helping brands connect way better with the, the most challenging segments, which is Gen Z, Millennials, and Alpha. Uh, that was part of problem uh, to solve back in 2016. So what we did is we thought of building a platform, but speaking of generative AI, back in 2016 was uh, a little bit way before its time. So we focused on one vertical, which is shoppable videos. That's what we called it. We were the first to create it and patent that technology. And it's basically videos that you can now, uh, uh, AI uh, analyzes the uh, frame by frame 
uh, and recognizes the objects and then tags the objects. This way you can create a commercial experience where people can watch a video, a music video, for example. And if you like what the um, uh, artist is wearing, you can just touch his jacket and buy it without leaving the experience, without leaving the video. There's no redirects, no websites. So we started with that. That was our beachhead. Nice, thanks. And so uh, folks that aren't familiar with uh, the Kingdom should know uh, it's a very young population, right? I believe the average age might be 35. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, so appealing to sort of this new type of consumer is so important. Is that sort of idea of just pushing innovation boundaries what led you to blockchain and AI? If I understand your question uh, right, then I think it's the because of the younger generation and then the gaming. Um, um, uh, enthusiasm that this young generation uh, had uh, and the high intimate penetration rate uh, kind of led to a situation where most of the crowd is ready. What the technology provides what was way less than what the community is ready for. So whatever you actually produce, they'll consume it. They'll take it, they'll use it, they'll give you an opinion about it, whether they like it or they don't. And, um, you know, you get that feedback and you kind of enhance what you want to do. But you've got a very vibrant and responsive community here in Saudi Arabia. That's great. I mean, that certainly starts the innovation spectrum. We were just at Iban yesterday. Uh, really fascinating and uh, well, well put together event that had companies startups from all different sort of sectors of of uh of the economy but it was all about online engagement i mean that was the the theme uh what are your sort of takeaways on the industries that are most ripe for disruption using the type of technology that drop group was focused on so what drop is uh is a generative ai platform that help uh communities whether those are corporates or individual communities uh, uh, to create web-free experiences with no-code or low-code. Uh, so it can help um, an organization, no matter big or small, to create go-to-market experiences and actually deploy them um, in a very, very short time. Uh, so you can create um, uh, virtual reality or any type of extended reality uh, activation, whether it's a microverse or a metaverse, whatever you want to create. Basically, you just text, type that in a prompt, and it creates it for you. So the criticism of this type of technology historically, you know, at one point, I remember the theme of, of last year, people thought this is the year of the metaverse, is that some of these metaverse experiences can be quite Quiet. So I'm curious um, where you've seen the most active virtual experiences thrive and what are the use cases for deploying these experiences that make sense? I mean, is this the sort of thing where, you know, putting it into a government agency, for example, or putting it into a major exposition that's, you know, year round um, where you have a lot of people that are naturally going to be there? Is that important like what was your advice to sort of organizations thinking about doing this to ensure that it's not too quiet again utility and use cases you gotta take a step back and think of the utility i mean a metaverse looks really impressive but if it's if it's just out there for looks then people are gonna see it once and not come again and can you give us an example of like a metaverse with the utility that you built or in the process of building Sure, we've uh, done uh, the uh, cultural metaverse for uh, Saudi Arabia, which is the official cultural metaverse for Saudi Arabia, together with uh, the Ministry of Culture. In there, you can go and uh, see the history of Saudi Arabia since 1727, how the country started and uh, what were the fashion back in the days, depending on the different region, what were the culinary uh, arts going on in, in, in this country. Food here is amazing. <laughs> it's very diverse. Uh, uh, Saudi has extremely rich um, um, heritage and extremely rich culture because of the diversity uh, uh, 
of the culture. You get a sense of the music history. Of- Absolutely. You can also see the musical uh, um, uh, instruments that were used uh, back in the days and the type of genres that were uh, culturally um, uh, consumed uh, by the community back then. But it's a, a very immersive experience. Was there something sort of really surprising that you learned from building this experience? Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, the, the the fashion part was fascinating for me uh, personally. And um, for those that don't know, uh, Basil is definitely into fashion. He's always rocking an awesome look every time I've met you. Thank you, thank you. The important role of uh, horses and camels, it's just an integral part of the society and the fabric of, of the society uh, uh, since a very, very long time. Um, amazingly, also, uh, the events that happened during the history, because we were not improvising. There were uh, dedicated entities that basically gives us the information, make sure that we're um, every piece of information, whether it's an object or uh, a word or whatever it is, basically, is being carefully revised and making sure that it belongs to that era. That's really cool. And what's been sort of the the adoption? Is this an experience that folks can, uh, they have to download an app or are they going on the internet or they have to go to sort of key places? How does sort of this activation work? So most of the... Uh, activations that we do or the environments that we built uh we keep it light and it's accessible through the web uh so you can promote that in uh social media or in any other third party's website as soon as you hit that link or scan that qr code boom you're there in the environment um uh rocking and rolling so you don't need anything you just need internet and a phone and how are you specifically using blockchain AI as you sort of build out these environments? Yeah, that's the key. So, uh, metaverses are a aesthetically good to see. Right. I mean, second light, right? It's not like the idea that metaverse is new. Correct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But adding AI and blockchain, that's where we excel and that's where we unique, globally unique. Um, in all of our environments, we remove the complexity from using blockchain or building blockchain, having smart contracts, uh, creating uh, rewards tokens. Uh, Users can actually do that on the fly with no code at all. Uh, The use of AI and, uh, uh, you know, giving a face to an LLM, an assistant, a digital assistant that you can talk to and it responds back. Um, uh, it responds back to you um, is, is something that we find very uh, um, helpful in these environments that we've uh, built, especially when it's corporates, because they don't want to use something, they don't want to use a, a, a chat GBT like where they can put their policies and procedures all over the internet. They want to keep that private. So we do provide them that um, facility. So at least in the U.S., COVID changed society quite a lot. Um, and it really activated this idea of sort of um, going deeper into the digital world because we weren't hanging out with each other and now we are uh how do you see sort of metaverse experiences like the ones that you're building shaping consumer behavior over the next several decades um there's there's uh more than one angle to answer this question so specifically in saudi uh, what was surprising to me is that Saudi before COVID is very different than Saudi after COVID. First of all, we got to realize the challenges presented by the Vision 2030. For those that don't know, this is the kingdom's very ambitious, all-encompassing vision of essentially being the place to go. This is what it comes down into. Yeah, and um, it, it kind of put or raised the bar for whether corporates or government entities, uh, which demanded adoption of emerging technologies. Because without those emerging technologies, you can never achieve the objectives and the KPIs set by the Vision 2030. Key performance indicators. And 
you know, you say that word, it's a familiar word to me because I have a consulting background. It's not a common rule to Web3, but what I think our listeners need to understand, and I've been having meetings with government officials here at 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night. Um, you know, the government here is so bullish on innovation and so committed. They brought some of the best folks from internationally and locally together that are sort of sort of running the public sector like the private sector correct yeah uh so that was one angle again saudi being part of the g20 um kind of puts a little bit of more pressure to elevate the level of uh, standards and the level of service being provided by these government entities to either locals or even international communities and you know we didn't join uh, the G20 to be number 20. We want to rank up Saudi Arabia. So again, this puts uh, um, an incredible amount of ambition to elevate the uh, levels of services uh, in the country. Those two drivers made the adoption of emerging technologies um, uh, amazingly fast. So I, I left Saudi back in 2016 and to New York. And I came back uh, 2021 and we came back because we had a, um, a, a deal to sign with uh, the energy giant Aramco, which was crazy back in that uh, uh, time for this massive industrial company to walk into Web3. I mean, you can understand what that did to the Web3 community at that time. It just gave hope that, oh, these giant organizations are actually looking and watching closely the developments that are happening in Web3. So I came back thinking that I'm going to be working more with uh, the retail sector or working more with uh, the private sector. On the contrary, the government sector was actually leading the uh, innovation and the development in whether it's Web3 or any type of emerging technologies. They had no problem in um, uh, absorbing the the uh, uh, <laughs> the unfortunate outcomes that comes with innovating the research and development. I mean, sometimes you do a project and it fails, and then you do it again and again and again. But they had relentless passion to actually do this and achieve um, uh, their desired objectives out of these so so that's the government side let's go back to the consumer side short for for a moment um you know uh you you see sort of saudi arabia evolving how are consumer preferences and sort of habits going to change you know folks are already very heavy online users here what's next um i, I believe creation of value digital assets um um that's what we got uh, coming up ahead. Um, uh, fractional ownership, tokenization. A quick word from our sponsors who's ready to navigate the cutting edge of tomorrow's legal landscape. Because at Zuber Lawler, they're not just attorneys, they're visionaries. With expertise in emerging technologies like AI, blockchain, and the metaverse, they're paving the way for you to seize the future. For mergers and acquisitions to IP, their selective team delivers strategic solutions tailored to the ever-changing world of technology. Join us at Zuber Lawler, where the future meets the law at ZuberLawler.com. Back to the episode. I know that you all are experimenting with new consumer behavior with Dropflake, which is a swipe and earn sort of program and also sort of supports a really important component of sort of the future of IP. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, sure. So Droplink is a, a, a very unique, uh, a globally unique uh, technology that uh, help protect the uh, data integrity in the world of AI. So when you are using uh, an LLM, for example, how do you guarantee that you're not infringing on somebody else's IP? Um, Droplink basically protects your assets from being infringed on and helps protecting you from infringing on others' assets. Yeah, so... I think there's a misunderstanding that I want to clear up on this show about sort of the application of blockchain in in the kingdom. Uh, you're working on a project with Aramco. 
where uh, it's a closed loop token environment that is being adopted as we speak. Can you speak a little bit more in depth about that and sort of what the response has been from employees at Aramco? Yeah, so uh, our engagement with Aramco basically is to develop Web3 projects. This is the broad uh, uh, topic. And underneath that, we uh, have selected several projects, the first of which is to uh, gamify the entire work experience, employment um, or onboarding, uh, all the way to retirement, which, I mean, by nature, this is a, a long endeavor. Um, what we have created part of that project, basically, is a reward token that a ramp can use to reward positive behavior. So they encourage you to learn more about the company. Once you've done your safety training, for example, you earn coins, and then you can go and exchange these coins for immediate value, like you know, fill, fill your car with gas or use it with any of the 11,000 retailers that Aramco has already signed up some uh, special discounts for. How are employees responding to this program? What's been the feedback? Amazing, especially the uh, newly onboarded because they're young, getting a, a sick manual that is you know too dull to read. Um, I'm just playing a game and learning in the uh, meantime about the company that I'm working uh, uh, in, and I'm earning some coins that I can actually go and exchange for today's value. Um, I, I think this uh, is uh, this was a unbeatable experience within the environment over there. Um, also, because it's a, especially for new employees, it's a big company and this guy is the most lost guy in the organization. They still need to figure out how to get from one building to, uh, to another. They still need to figure out how to plan for their career, how to uh, kick off a project within their environment. And all of this is brought to them in this environment through a digital assistant that they can talk to and, you know, get answers in any language. Wow. That's really full. Cool. Yeah, I can imagine someone coming to work here that doesn't speak Arabic, that type of tool could be really valuable. And you know, I think that's actually one challenge, right, in the kingdom is, uh, you know, while most folks speak English, which is convenient for, for, for me um, navigating around here, it's not universal. Um, and I'm sure for those folks that don't speak English, they're equally frustrated by folks that don't speak Arabic, right? Sure. So um, I think this is something that AI can assist with. Absolutely. We also just have to like learn the other person's language, but um, and AI can help with that. But what are some of the other challenges that you face as sort of you're sort of on the forefront of adopting this primary technology in the kingdom? Um. What was a challenge is explaining this technology to uh, clients that we work with. Um, and also the stigma that comes with blockchain and cryptocurrency and trading. Then we have to do some education around where well, we're using the technology. We ain't going to be affected by the uh, trading part of it. Um, that took some time. Um, Another challenge is building local capacity. Um, AI engineers, blockchain engineers are really hard to find. Good ones, I mean. And um, we literally scout the globe for good resources. And um, it's just, I don't know yet how do we grow um, um local resources in Saudi. There is a local community, I'm sure. It's just we're fragmented and uh, um, we, we, we definitely need some government muscles to create programs that focuses young folks basically on um, becoming AI engineers or prompt engineers or um, blockchain engineers. There's a lot of future for that. Yeah, all that makes sense. More the reason for uh, folks to come here and, and, and join the fun, right? And you've been a big proponent of growing the web for ecosystem, uh, you know, in a way that everyone can, can benefit. So uh, talking about sort of that side of things, I mean, uh, in a lot of ways, you all are the only show in town that does specifically what, what you all do in terms of the metaverse engagement and whatnot. Um, sort of 
how do you sort of creatively sort of finesse these agreements, these contracts in a way that is a win-win for your partners and the longevity of, of Dot Group? And, and sort of how are you all going to keep innovating uh, in, to say sort of uh, top of the mountain as, as Warren folks come here? How do you see sort of Dot Group evolving? Uh, so we're active in both markets, Saudi market as well as the U.S. market. Um, we've delivered projects with uh, Warner Brothers, um, uh, Paramount. Our partner in Mars too, that's great. And now for a quick word from our sponsor before we dive into the next segment. Are you ready to take your sports predictions to the next level? Look no further than maincard.io, the fantasy management platform that's taking the blockchain world by storm. With maincard, every card is a ticket to excitement. You can predict sport outcomes, trade cards in the marketplace, and challenge opponents in thrilling weekly duels. And don't wait. Head to maincard.io now and start earning rewards with your NFTs because it pays to be early. And now back to today's episode. Whenever we innovate something in, in one market, we it, that definitely resonates in the other market. We will find someone who is interested in that particular type of innovation. The second thing is uh, our strategy is to create an implementation in each and every sector. So we've done uh, an energy with a the energy giant Ramco. Uh, we've uh, done a, a, an experience in sports that is to be announced soon. Um, we've done an experience in uh, uh, government slash culture, uh, which is the uh, Saudi uh, meta culture or the Saudi cultural metaverse. Um, uh, we're also doing the, uh, uh, Saudi cup, uh, which is the most expensive horse race in the world. Um, uh, we actually have an active POC right now being built in healthcare, um, which is focused on, um, to solve communication issues and reduce communication challenges between the caregiver and the patient because they're not necessarily talking uh, the same language. So uh, coming back to your uh, language challenge. So basically, you know, really showcasing the diversity of your capabilities is, is sort of the major comp competitive advantage. Correct. So if folks understand they can go to you for any big problem or challenge or opportunity. That makes sense. And uh, maybe you can just share a little advice for... Um, businesses that are thinking about sort of getting more exposed to what's happening in Saudi Arabia, especially uh, our friends in Wad3, and uh, they're sort of wondering what the opportunity here is. Um, you know, is it, do you think this is a limited right now to just companies that do blockchain gaming, or do you see broader opportunities, and what's your advice to those individuals? Um, I think what served us to have a client list uh, as impressive as the ones that we have, basically, because all of our clients are Fortune 500 companies. And I mean, all of them. We've never bothered explaining the technology. We've always kept the conversation focused on the uh, utility or the business objectives out of this engagement. Most of the um, entities, whether private or governmental in Saudi Arabia, are really under immense pressure to deliver. So if you're going to help them um, overcome the challenges that they're facing or achieve the business objectives that they want to achieve, you're definitely in and in for a long run. Very cool. And really appreciate your insights. We're going to get to know you a little bit better on the next segment. Before we do, any closing thoughts? Um, I think looking at the markets around Saudi, uh, sorry, around the world, uh, Saudi has one of the highest appetites among these markets and um it's it's the, the the different opportunities that are available here for uh the uh various innovative solutions around the world in web3 or any other emerging technologies um are definitely uh sought after so i think if you haven't been here um you should be uh, you should be uh, uh, coming more often, and I think a good landing pad to uh, Saudi and um, exposing these opportunities basically is out of edge, uh, out of edge in Riyadh. 
Well, yeah, you, you just walked right into uh, that softball. Thank you for that. I'm a deliverer of that uh, event, basically. It's the best thing we've ever seen. And thank you very much for those of you listening that maybe um, weren't listening to the show before. We did a big event in April of 2024 called Ira Adria. It was our first time we work with Animoca Brands and The Garage and mm-hmm. Neom. And we had over 40 partners and very fortunate that CNN, uh, Arabic, and, and Arab News covered the event. Uh, Drop Group was one of our partners and, um, you know, we're so grateful for you supporting the first year. It's just going to get bigger and better from here. Stay tuned for more details on the date next year. We'll be announcing that very soon. Um, with that, uh, let's get to know you a little better and move on to our next segment. Uh, so we've got a chance to learn more about Drop Group. Now we're going to have a chance to learn more about its chairman, Fazl. So Edge Quick Caters is a fun, quick way to get to know you segment. There's going to be 10 questions. We're looking for a short or few word response, but feel free to expand if you get the urge. You ready for this? Let's go. All right. What is the first thing you remember ever purchasing in your life? Online or offline? In your total, your whole life, it was a a, a toy, definitely. Uh, it was a Winnie the Pooh. Nice. What type of was it? Was it like a stuffed animal? Or? A stuffed animal. Yeah. Nice. What did the class? What is the first thing you remember ever selling in your life? Oh, um, so uh, I am from Mecca, and um, there's a lot of pilgrims that come to Mecca annually, and uh, we work. Uh, uh, normally so I'd, uh, I was eight basically and we uh, used to sell different kind of stuff basically uh, it was uh, mainly uh, I think fruits uh, you know a little kid might have chopped up fruit or no just fruits the way it is bananas yep. oranges apples if you're uh, on poker you need your enemy right I mean we got like five million people in town so you know, they're gonna eat why not they probably you know their bananas didn't make the trip, so. Uh, what is the most recent thing you purchased? Recent thing? Um, this guy? Virtual Insanity? Yes. Uh, I felt it's uh, very relevant to what we do. And um, uh, let's, let's see if we can bring sanity to this insanity. I love it. What is the most recent thing you sold? Um, that's so we just closed a, a digital twin project a while ago. Okay, fifteen minutes ago. There you go. So uh, that's fa- fairly recent. I think that qualifies. We'll learn more about that project soon. I, I hope. What is your most prized possession? Mm, my memories. Hmm. I like that one. I don't know. We passed that answer on the show before. If you could buy anything in the world, digital, physical, service, or experience is currently for sale, what would it be? Apes. Like board apes? Board apes, yeah. Yeah. All right. If you could pass on one of your personality traits to the next generation, what would it be? Being a good judge of character. Mm. If you could eliminate one of your personality traits from next generation, what would it be? Oh. Time organization, maybe. I mean, being innovative is sometimes go against having a, a specific routine and sticking to a specific routine. Uh, I wish I could. Yeah, somehow combine those two. I I don't have a specific routine. There's probably some word for what you described. We've asked perplexity after the podcast. See what comes up. But in part, it actually perplexity can help you uh, get that routine. So, you know, we'll, we'll see if we can uh, eliminate this habit before we get to the next generation. Um, I I have the same challenges, you know, being an entrepreneur and, and balancing a lot of different uh, balls in the air. 
So what did you do just before joining us on the podcast? You mean today? Are you here this morning? Yeah. Um, so I usually, especially when the weather is uh, good as it is right now, we have to go for long walks. Nice. I I love a good morning walk before a city wakes up. Yes. Where you see a couple folks here and there and it's, it's chill and you can appreciate the architecture more. You just start the day with this positive energy that, that enables you to, you know, maintain a um, uh, high level of energies for a longer and extended hours. You're also getting vitamin D, right? That's part of it. Uh, it's your, your standards and your circadian rhythm. So it's up. And what are you going to do next after this podcast? Lunch. Nice. How about some barbecue ribs? There you go. Um, well, we, we sometimes like to ask our guests a, a bonus question, and I have one for you that I'm curious about, which is, uh, I know you're really into fashion. Uh, what is currently your favorite brand or sort of e-commerce fashion website that you like to, to check out? So in terms of brands, I like to uh, always promote the brands that I know the designers of, um, part of, you know, contributing to the ecosystem. Um, and there's a, uh, you know, one of the local ones, uh, is, uh, Bram Chinnery, uh, it's, a look, it's like Dick Chinnery, uh, but it's brand Chinnery. Oh, like dictionary brand, brand, brand Chinnery. Correct. Got it. Yeah. Full. Uh, a very smart local guy who has uh, uh, managed to create uh, a really um, uh, good brand in terms of quality or in terms of even of quantity in Saudi Arabia. Um, there's also 1886, which is a Saudi brand uh, as well. Um, internationally, I love Kuji. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge brand, been huge uh, for the past 15, uh, sorry, 50 years. And they innovate. They've gotten it to Web3, right? So, yep. Very cool. Well, some local Saudi Arabia fashion alpha. Thank you for that. And thank you for participating in Edge Quick Hitters. It wasn't so bad, right? Sure. No, absolutely. This is uh, really good. And I look forward to uh, uh, seeing even other um, uh, episodes. The views and opinions expressed on Edge of NFT reflect solely those views and opinions of the show hosts and its guests. Please make sure to do your own research. Our show is not financial advice. You understand that you are using any and all information available on or through this podcast at your own risk. Whenever making financial decisions, we recommend doing your own research and talking to your accountant for financial advice. From time to time, we may feature sponsored content on the show for which we receive value, and we may share links for which we receive a commission if you make a purchase through one of those links. Refer to our website, www.edgeofnft.com, for our full disclaimer, terms and conditions, and privacy policy.